Good evening to everyone. On behalf of the Clackamas Stewardship Partners of Forest Collaborative, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's uh, presentation. My name is Robert Roth and I serve as a facilitator for this group. Uh, CSP promotes forest management practices that incorporate the best available science and contribute to healthy forest and resilient communities. Um, the reason we've got doing this presentation tonight is in 2020, Argonians experienced a devastating series of wildfires impacting communities and forests. Uh, residents and organizations want to know why this happened and what we can do to promote healthy Northwest forest and communities under changing conditions. Uh, we just have uh, two uh, basic uh, housekeeping items for tonight's presentation. The first is because of the size of the audience, we're not gonna be able to do participant introductions. And the second thing is if you have questions, please enter them into the chat room and we'll go ahead and get to the questions after we finish the presentations. And uh, we've got, uh, to two presentations and we may get more people trickling in, but uh, Jessica and David, why don't we go ahead and get started? Thanks, Robert. And hey everyone, just really quick. My name is Michael Crofta. I'm the Forest Watch Coordinator for BARC, which uh, if you're not familiar, it's a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to defending and restoring forests surrounding Mount Hood. And uh, we're also a long-term, long-time member of the, the Clackamas Stewardship Partner. Um, so I'm going to briefly introduce tonight's speakers. But first, I'd just like to say that I'm really excited um, to uh, hearing a little bit of an echo. I think someone might need to mute. Yeah, I'm really excited to see the Forest Service sort of on the verge of releasing the climate vulnerability assessment for the Mount Hood, the Willamette National Forest, as well as the Columbia River Gorge scenic area. And uh, I know that after its release and in the coming years, BARC is going to be very committed to collaborating with the agency to ensure those findings make their way into the work the agency is doing on the ground to build some real climate resilience in the forest. And so I just want to thank everyone again um, for being here for that this important discussion. So Jessica Halofsky is the director of the USDA Northwest Climate Hub and the Northwest or the Forest Service Western Wildland Environmental Threat Assessment Center. In her role Jessica promotes applied climate change science and adaptation in natural resources in the Northwest and across the entire West. Jessica has a background in forest ecology and fire, but has been doing climate change adaptation work in the Northwest for over a decade. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, in her previous position, she pioneered one of the first climate change vulnerability assessment and adaptation projects with the Olympic National Forest and Park. And so since that initial project, Jessica has co-led eight other sub-regional and regional scale climate change vulnerability assessment and adaptation partnerships around the Western U.S. And Dave Peterson, who's the other speaker tonight, is a professor of forest biology at the University of Washington School of Environmental and Forest Sciences and a senior research scientist with the U.S. Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station. He's conducted research on fire science and climate change around the Western United States and has published 250 scientific articles and four books on these topics. He was a contributing author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and co-led the fourth chapter of the fourth National Climate Assessment. He currently works on climate change assessments and adaptation on federal lands in the Western United States. And Dave lives in Skagit County, Washington, where he manages Mountain Heart Tree Farm. And I'll just add that David and Jessica um, recently collaborated on a paper called Changing Wildfire, Changing Forests, a synthesis on the effects of climate change on fire regimes and vegetation in the Pacific Northwest that I very much recommend reading. 
And so with that, again, I just wanted to remind folks to please keep yourself muted so we can best enjoy the presentation. And then you can put any comments or questions you have in the chat at any time where I'll be able to select from those once we do our Q&A. So thanks again and take it away, David. Okay, can you hear me okay, Michael? Sounds fine, David. Yep. Okay, very good. Well, we'll plunge forward here. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to join you this evening. Welcome everyone. Thanks for taking time out of your evening to learn a little bit about climate change and forests. So uh, we're up here in Northwest Washington, we're still kind of in the grips of La Nina. Uh, we had both snow and hail today at our house in Skagit County. Uh, but as Robert mentioned in the introduction, the fires of 2020 are still very fresh on the minds of all of us in the Pacific Northwest. And I, I assume, especially for the folks who are on the uh, presentation tonight. So uh, we certainly will talk about fire, but we also want to talk about the broader context of climate change and forests, as well as to put some emphasis on some potential solutions and options that we have. And I would also like to mention that uh, through our work with National Forests in the Northwest region, Jessica and I have become very aware of the critical contribution that various collaborative groups play in helping National Forests to come up with ideas, uh, think through things in terms of resource management, and also to help facilitate implementation. So thank you all for, for your interest and concern about natural resources. Okay, well, let, let's get started. We'll have a little bit of context to start. And um, so we're gonna be talking about climate change effects. We'll be talking about not just forests, but other natural resources as well in North Central Oregon. We'll be talking about how we might adapt to climate change. And then we'll be talking about, uh, again, not just forests, but other natural resources as well. Okay. Well, you see this uh, not so pretty picture here of some Western red cedar and Western hemlock that don't look too healthy. And I was wondering if just very quickly, uh, you could use that little reactions button down there in the lower right of your screen to tell me whether or not you have seen this sort of thing somewhere near where you live or where you have been recreating over the last few years. Anybody seen any dead and dying trees out there? Okay seen lots of affirmation. <laughs> One person said, yes, too much. Um, and I think you know, just about everyone who spends any time out in the woods has seen this sort of thing happening. And I believe this has gotten the attention of the general public. Uh, you know, we talk and talk and talk about climate change, but until it actually hits you in the face, it, it isn't always real. So next. So let's talk a little bit about drought. Drought was really the cause of this kind of mortality and decline that we were seeing in Western Red Cedar. And so let's take a look at what was happening in 2015. Oregon was in the grip of the record drought. In fact, the entire Pacific Northwest looks somewhat like this. The, the more red there is here, the worse the drought was, but you know, basically the whole state was in severe to extreme, extreme drought. So this set the context for the kind of stress that we were seeing in forest ecosystems and for the kinds of conditions needed for fire. 2015 was also a big fire year. Next. All right, so here's some information. This is just grabbed off of a, a, a news site, but this is what the Northwest drought looked like in 2015, 17, and 18, had very dry summers. Dry summers are important in the Pacific Northwest because first of all, summers are always dry. Winters are almost always wet, but if that is exacerbated by very high temperatures and lack of rainfall in the summer, that's what really accentuates stress in forest ecosystems. And that is why we saw those dead and dying trees. So most of our, our conifers are actually quite tolerant of drought for one year maybe, but once you get two or three in short succession, that uh, becomes uh, very stressful for them and some are not gonna make it. Next. So this leads into the question I, I so often get is, you know, how will trees grow in a warmer climate? 
And our low elevation west side forests, our iconic forests of Douglas fir, western hemlock, and so forth, um, even though we have this sort of stereotype of a very wet Pacific Northwest, summers are always dry. And these are moisture limited species. If you dig a, a soil pit in the summer in a forest, it's usually gonna be pretty dry. So these moisture limited trees will probably grow more slowly in the future. In fact, we have scientific data to support that inference. Now, I heard there was some interest in um, Oregon white oak as well amongst your group. And so this is a, another species that is you know, relatively common in the drier areas of the Northwest, particularly in Oregon. And so we anticipate that a species that's already drought tolerant might actually do okay in the future and might do better than some of these conifers. So it's not all bad news. Next. Now, if we go over into the east side of the Cascades, we of course have a different set of species, Ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, Western larch. Now these species are really quite drought tolerant, but they get much less rainfall than we do on the west side. And so they are also moisture limited and their growth will also decrease. Again, we have very good scientific evidence to support this. And then let's go up in elevation a little bit and think about our coniferous forests at high elevations, subalpine fir, mountain hemlock, lodgepole pine. Now, we have a little bit of a different picture here because these species are all energy limited, which means they need heat and they need to be snow free. Because of the snowpack, some of these trees may be snow free for only six to eight weeks. So a warmer climate that gives them a more snow free environment will actually be beneficial and a lot of them may increase in their growth. So again, uh, there are winners and losers and some of these species might actually be winners in a warmer climate. Another important type of system uh, are our riparian areas, wetlands, and other kinds of systems that are controlled by water. I expect that these types of forest systems will be quite sensitive in the future because they're so water controlled. So we anticipate that in some of these areas, we might get some changes in species composition and maybe even that some of these uh, types of riparian forests could be more susceptible to fire than they ever have been in the past. So that would be a significant change. Next. All right, so everything I talked about is just fine. We're talking about changes in temperature and so forth. But the biggest challenge we have here is that extreme weather, those rare events that we might have, rare droughts uh, and so forth, is increased disturbance. And uh, Oregon certainly experienced that big time in 2020. This is the thing that changes systems rapidly. Next. So one thing that has really been observed over the last, well, actually 30 years or so now across the Western US are the effects of mountain pine beetles. So increasing temperature has allowed this insect to increase its reproductive rate as well as to expand its range uh, farther northward and farther up in elevation than it's ever been observed before. Next. And in fact, this is, this is a map here of how broadly it's been distributed. And just another click there, Jessica. And we can see that this uh, insect has caused mortality across 50 million acres. This has been an unprecedented type of disturbance in North American forests. And it has, has reached you know, pretty much every corner of the American West as well as the Canadian West. So this is an enormous change in ecosystems that was directly influenced by temperature, but through an insect. Next. I wanted, I wanted to mention too, um, that there really is quite a bit of uncertainty 
about how other kinds of insects and pathogens may affect our forests in the future. So I know um, a lot of folks are interested in things like sudden oak death, for example, and just don't have very much scientific information that tells us what's going to happen with pathogens in a warmer climate. Uh, one would expect that if trees are weakened by uh, high temperature and drought, that we might have greater impacts, but we also know that that's not always the case. So this isn't all cut and dry. There's still a lot of uncertainty. So, okay, let's, let's talk about wildfire now. Um, this is a projection of what we expect wildfire to look like around mid-century. And so this is a statistical modeling exercises, exercise that takes historical data and basically pushes it forward in time to a new climate. And we see lots of these big red and orange splotches on the map. The redder it is, the, the more fire we expect in the future. And this is um, expressed in area burn. So I don't take these, these big patches terribly literally, but if you wanna just remember one thing, Somewhere around mid-century, we expect we'll have maybe two to three times more area burned than we've had historically. So if you take this past year's area burned in the West, which was around 10 million acres, and you multiply that by two or three, you start getting some pretty big numbers. And you can see that there might be some pretty big changes across our forest ecosystem. So definitely much more fire in our future. The other thing we need to be aware of too, that none of these things act independently. Fire and insects interact. So what we see here is an animation of how fire and insects and disease have spread across the greater Northwest. So if you'll just watch this for a moment, you'll start seeing these orange patches and brown patches start to appear over time. So this was just a 20 year sequence. And look at the amount of land area that was covered by fire during that time. Now I don't have the last three years of data, but that would be even more orange than this uh, particular map is. So you can see how quickly these factors can move across a landscape. And we also see that fire patches are starting to run into fire patches and fire is starting to run into insect and disease patches. So again, these disturbances are what will really create big changes in our future forest ecosystem. Next. All right, well, let's, let's at least have a brief discussion on the, the fires of this past summer in Northwest Oregon. So the, the four fires that are shown in this map, and I'm, I'm guessing most of you know most of these fire names by heart. Uh, these four fires together burned around 710,000 acres, just four fires. The Beachy Creek Fire, I believe, spread something like 130,000 acres in just one day. So these were extraordinary events, kinds of things you know, most of us have never seen on the west side of the Cascades and thought we might never see. But here we, here we did see it this past year. Now, I want to kind of digress from the climate change theme for a minute. The real critical factor here is, as many of you probably know, were these strong east winds. Warm, dry winds coming over, up and over the Cascades were the key factor in, in fire spread here. So we really can't say this is a climate change event per se. What we can say is we had extreme weather. Um, these kinds of fires have occurred historically. They're rare, but when they do occur, they, they were always, almost always driven by these east winds. So this is the kind of thing that would in some ways be equivalent to a much warmer climate, but the key factor for these types of fires is in fact those, those east winds. Um, we do, however, expect that we'll probably have more fire on the west side in the future, maybe not of this magnitude. Next. All right, so just taking a look at that drought map again, and I do recommend that folks take a look at this. There's a, a wonderful website called the US Drought Monitor. 
Uh, it's updated weekly, it has historical data, and you can see what the drought situation is all over uh, the United States. Very, very well done website. So this is why we had these fires going on last year in September. It's all, again, in a severe to extreme drought situation. So the fuels were very, very dry, and they were conducive to rapid fire spread and large area burns. Next. All right, so just to wrap up the first part here, um, in terms of vegetation disturbance in the Northwest and in Oregon in particular, uh, we expect that most of our conifer species will have less growth uh, and will have higher mortality from some of these disturbances. Bigger fires, more area burned. Uh, we didn't really mention uh, invasive species, non-native species here, but if we have more fires, then we are creating the perfect opening for those species to spread across the landscape. Uh, if these fires get up into our subalpine forests, uh, where the tree species don't have much resistance to fire, we may lose some of those. And we expect perhaps a decrease in conifer down in some places and younger forests in general if we have more frequent fires. Next. All right, so this is where I'm gonna jump in here. And I wanted to tell you about a recent climate change vulnerability assessment that we conducted on the Columbia River Gorge Nation National Scenic Area and Mount Hood and Willamette National Forest. We called this uh, the, the CMW Adaptation Partnership for short. So the objectives of this project were to do a science-based climate change vulnerability assessment and to use that information to develop adaptation strategies and tactics to help deal with negative effects of climate change and transition systems to new conditions. Um, we also wanted to develop other tools and information uh, sources to help resource managers incorporate climate change in, in what they do. So we did call this a science management partnership. It was a partnership between scientists with the Forest Service Research and Development Branch and managers on the National Forest System units, uh, along with other partners. And so the first step was to conduct a vulnerability assessment, and that occurred over about a year. Uh, and then we uh, wanted to identify adaptation strategies and tactics based on that assessment. And then the final step is to uh, basically publish a, a peer-reviewed report. So I'll tell you a little bit more about each of these steps. So this was a multi-resource assessment. It included uh, future climate projections, uh, water resources and infrastructure, fisheries, uh, vegetation and ecological disturbance, wildlife, habitats, uh, recreation, and then other ecosystem services like carbon, uh, pollination, water quality, uh, and cultural heritage. And so these are some of the different roles we had in the project. We did have a, a science team and a science lead for each of those areas I just showed you. And the science team really took the lead on uh, developing and synthesizing the scientific information. They did a lot of the writing. Uh, in many cases, they ran models and, and summarized output. Uh, we had uh, regional program managers from the Pacific Northwest region of the Forest Service that helped to provide guidance and assist with uh, interpretation of data and information. And then we had specialists on each of the National Forest units that provided data, local expertise, and they were the ones that really took the lead on developing the adaptation strategies and tactics. So after we had developed the vulnerability assessment, we held a two-day workshop in Salem, Oregon. And the first day of that workshop was focused on the vulnerability assessment. Uh, we had scientists presenting the assessment results. And then we got some feedback and had some discussion around that, uh, made sure we weren't missing anything and that we were uh, really addressing all of the local issues. And then on the second day, we had the, the specialists from the units really taking lead on developing those adaptation strategies and tactics. And we did that by resource area in small work groups um, and then summarized all of the, that information to include in the report. This was the overall timeline. Uh, it was about a, a two and a half year project. We're uh, 
I'm happy to report that we just got the general technical report out. So it's, it's submitted to the Pacific Northwest Research Station. Uh, so it can now be cited as in press. And I did put that in the chat if you scroll all the way up. Uh, some of you might have come in a little too late for that. So I'll put it in again when, when we're done here. But I wanted to go over uh, some of the non-forest uh, resource areas and what we're, what's in the report and what we expect to happen in those. So I'm going to start with uh, snow and water. And so we're expecting quite a few changes in snowpack and in the future with warming temperatures. We're going to have uh, less precipitation falling as snow, more falling as rain. And so there are a couple of different ways to look at how snowpack can change. Um, one of them on the left hand side is called snow water equivalent and it's usually measured on April 1st and it's basically the amount of water that we expect in in snowpack so it gives an indication of, of what the water year will be like uh, and so you can see there uh, when we get into these orange colors we're expecting by the end of the century uh, up to 80 to 100 percent decline in snowpack and you can see that's that's primarily happening in the higher elevations in the Cascades. Um, these other areas with the open squares, you know, they never had um, persistent snowpack. It was it was more ephemeral. Um, and then we, if we look here on the right, it's a this is a measure of change uh, in snow residence time. So that's the number of days we expect snow to persist. And this shows the change between a historical period and again the end of the century. And you can see a lot of those orange colors, again, those higher elevation areas where we expect uh, pretty dramatic reductions in, in snow resonance time and number of days in the year. And of course, with warmer temperatures, we are expecting our glaciers to uh, be reduced in area. Um, there's a great group at Portland State University led by Andrew Fountain, and they helped us pull some of this information together looking at here on the left at the glaciers on Mount Hood. And so the uh, kind of purplish color here on the bottom shows the glacier extent in 1907. And then the lighter blue color shows the glacier extent in 2016. So you can see these glaciers are, have already shrunk quite a bit and we're expecting that to continue into the future with climate change. So when we have these changes in temperatures and in snowpack and what type of precipit precipitation we get, uh, we're going to have changes in stream flow. So when we have less snowpack, earlier melt, we get the water running off earlier in the year, and then there's not as much left at the end of the summer. So we're expecting that the stream flows in the summer will be lower than they were historically. And the, where we expect the biggest changes are again those higher elevation areas along the Cascade Crest uh, where we had more snowpack historically. So this, this shows a percent decrease in mean summer stream flow between a historical period and again the end of the century. Um, this is using a, a hydrological model called the variable infiltration capacity model. And so you can see those streams in orange and red are where we expect somewhere in the range of a 50 to 80% reduction in summer stream flow. The lower elevations aren't as, as affected uh, because they're not as influenced by snowpack. At the same time, when we have less snow in the winter, uh, we have more precipitation as rain and we have uh, more intense rainfall events, which we are expecting with climate change, we're likely to get higher peak stream flows, which could lead to flooding. So these are projections for future peak stream flows. And again, these kind of oranges and reds are looking at uh, some about 30 to more than 40% increase in peak stream flows in the winter. Again, those, the, the greatest changes are concentrated in those areas that are most impacted by uh, snowpack. So what we can do with that information about uh, increased peak stream flow is look at where we have roads that are close to streams, uh, because that's where we expect the, ro the roads to be uh, affected by flooding over and over again. 
So this uh, figure on the left is showing where we expect uh, increases in peak flows uh, for roads that are less than 300 feet from a stream. So these areas in red and orange are, are those roads where we might want to take another look at those roads because we expect that those roads might get a lot of damage in the future. Uh, in some cases where there's not a lot of need for a road in those red and orange areas, we might want to think about maybe moving that road, getting rid of that road. Another interesting thing about the loss of snowpack is that we might have some roads available in the winter that haven't been historically uh, because of snowpack, but with less no snowpack, we could have roads accessible for a longer portion of the year. And so these areas in red are where we expect uh, the number of days uh, where the snow cover decreases to be in the kind of 60 to 83 day range. So a substantial decrease in the amount of time those roads would be covered in snow. And switching it to stream temperature with higher temperatures and also those lower summer stream flows I just talked about, we're expecting to have higher stream temperatures. And so overall, we're expecting about a, a two and a half, so about five degree Fahrenheit increase in August stream temperatures by the end of the century. And you can see this big red band is the, the Columbia River where we're expecting some pretty substantial uh, increases in temperature and, and really putting the river ab above uh, critical thresholds for our cold water adapted uh, fish species. So what we can do with that information is think about particular fish species and what their tolerance is for different temperatures. And we can and think about those, those thermal thresholds for those species, see where they currently exist and what the temperature is like that, you know, has, has been like historically in those places and what we expect it to be like in the future. So this is a, a figure for bull trout, um, the species that's very sensitive to stream temperature. On the left are the historical habitats and the approximate stream temperatures. And here are, on the right are what we expect for those same areas at the end of the century. And you can see some areas remain good habitat, uh, some do not. Some are, pro are not likely to be good habitat in the future. So this can really help us decide where to prioritize some of our uh, stream restoration activities in the future. All right, shifting to wildlife, there was an assessment for wildlife done uh, for a number of different uh, focal habitats. And so I'm not gonna go through all of these. I'll, I'll let you take a look at the assessment if you're interested, but I did want to uh, highlight the subalpine habitats and these habitats uh, have species like this here in Nevada red fox, uh, larch mountain salamander, and the American pika. Um, the habitats are really characterized by deep snow. Uh, they're very open woodlands and meadows at these high elevation, uh, but they also have rock and talus. A number of existing stressors uh, that include uh, recreation, timber harvest, and uh, land use change. In the future, we're expecting that these, these areas are going to be highly exposed to climate change in the sense that there's going to be a substantial loss of snowpack. And it could potentially lead to drought stress uh, for the vegetation in these habitats and could lead to more trees invading meadows. Uh, some of the key sensitivities here are uh, for our wildlife species are the, the temperature and moisture stress we expect. Uh, a lot of these habitats have, and, and populations within that, these habitats have very limited distribution. They're already fragmented. So it will be hard for these species to respond to those changes in climate because they don't have a lot of uh, connectivity of their habitats. And in terms of adaptive capacity, these species don't, uh, like some of the lower elevation species, they can't necessarily move upwards in elevation to find uh, suitable, suitable habitat because there's there's not really anything of, uh, upwards in elevation for them to go to. Um, but we do expect that there might be refugia or areas that aren't as affected by climate change that still maintain the habitat that these species need. And so 
those refugia will uh, hopefully be helpful to these species and, and help them to maintain uh, some populations in the future. All right, moving on to recreation. Uh, and so the assessment did cover a number of, a number of different types of recreation. I'm just gonna highlight uh, warm weather and uh, cold weather recreation here, but there are other, other types covered like uh, fishing and water-based recreation. Uh, so in the assessment area, we, warm weather recreation is about 65% of all recreation. It's really the primary recreation in the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area, about 56% in the Willamette National Forest and 35% in, on the Mount Hood National Forest. Uh, we do expect the increased temperatures will affect warm weather recreation. Um, we're expecting extended sh shoulder seasons. So that's basically the spring and the fall. And we expect these to be longer. The, the total amount of time where people can recreate will be longer with warmer climate. Um, so it should be an overall a good thing for uh, warm weather recreation activities. Um, there is some question about uh, day versus overnight use, mainly will people want to go out and camp overnight in the spring when their kids are in school? So there's still some uh, open questions about how people will respond. Uh, but of course, wildfire and smoke uh, could be a negative effect on warm weather recreation. And uh, our September was a prime example of that. So overall, uh, with those, those different changes, we expect a moderate increase in participation in warm weather recreation. And this is a, a figure of the Eagle Creek fire and then different recreation areas that were still closed. Uh, you can see a lot of the ones in uh, red were still closed uh, up to two years after the fire event. So this is just to show that these, these large fires can really have a substantial effect on recreation that's, that's relatively long lasting. It takes a while to get all these, these recreation areas open again. All right, moving on to snow-based recreation. Uh, so this includes downhill cross-country skiing, snowshoeing, and snowmobiling. Um, it's uh, about 23% of recreation on all of the three units in the assessment area, about half for Mount Hood and a little under 10% for the Willamette. But we know that the snow-based recreation is really going to be negatively affected by climate change with the increase in temperatures, later snowfall, reduced snowpack, uh, an overall shorter snow season, and we expect a, some closures of our lower elevation ski areas. So we expect a, there to be a substantial effect on, on snow-based recreation. And this is a figure showing all of the uh, winter recreation sites with the little blue snowflakes in the assessment area. And then overlaid with that, again, this uh, percentage decline in snow residence time. So the number of days we expect snow to persist and so you can see which areas, you know, if you have a blue dot in an orange area, we expect that area to be at risk with climate change because snow is not going to uh, persist as long in those areas. And so um, you might wanna rethink the location of those, those snow areas in the oranges in the future. And this is a, a figure showing visits to a number of the different uh, regional uh, ski areas. And the, the big thing to look at here is that year 2014, 2015. That was our, our winter without snow. And you can see a lot of the visitation numbers really dipped in that year. And the exception is really Mount Bachelor. And that's because Mount Bachelor is at a sufficiently high elevation that the snowpack uh, persists there where it doesn't in uh, these, some of these other places like Timberline, Mount Hood Meadows, and Mount Hood Ski Bowl. Um, so it's an interesting thing to think about in the future. Um, Mount Bachelor might, might be a, a refuge for skiers in those, in those years where we have low snowpack. Okay, so I just want to show that we've uh, done a number of vulnerability assessments around the Pacific Northwest. We've covered 
uh, almost all of the national forests in the region. Um, the exception is we just working on the Sayusla National Forest in the Oregon coast, and that assessment is still uh, being developed, but um, we do have the uh, CMW assessment now out, and I'm, I am going to post it to this website uh, sometime this week. So if you're not able to download it from the chat tonight, want to take a look, it will be uh, on this website, and you're, you're welcome to share this website with others who might be interested. Um, eventually, it will be published as a general technical report through the Pacific Northwest Research Station. So the, the version I gave you tonight is not pretty, but uh, it will be all laid out professionally and uh, there will be uh, hard copies of it as well. And with that, I'll shift back to Dave. Okay, well, you got a, a really good overview of uh, some things that we're expecting in future decades in North Central Oregon. And I, I hope that a lot of that will kind of make sense to you in terms of resources that you're familiar with, places you're familiar with. So now we want to switch gears a little bit into what, what I would call the hopeful part of our presentation this evening. And that is, you know, what, what are some of the things that we can do to facilitate more resilient forest in a warmer climate? And I just want to tell folks too that I'm, I'm uh, on satellite internet this evening, and so that's why you're experiencing a little bit of a lag effect between audio and video occasionally. That's also why I'm keeping my video off to save some bandwidth. All right, so regeneration is where the action is. Uh, we expect we're going to have more disturbances, and so there's this big competition that occurs after a fire or after an insect outbreak, and that determines the winners and losers. That determines, you know, what the genetics of those species are. That determines which species actually exist. Those little trees out on that kind of bare landscape experience really high variation in temperature and moisture at the soil surface. And remember that their soil or their uh, root system is actually quite small. So that's why they're very sensitive to drought, soil moisture, but this, this is what's going to determine what our future forests look like. So as we go through this, I'm going to uh, speak to some things I call good practices or best practices, things we can do to encourage the resilience of our forest. Um, because of the potential soil moisture stress and the little seedlings, we have to do whatever we can to retain that moisture. That may mean doing more mulching, as we see in the uh, upper photo there. And of course, we always have to be aware of the usual stresses that we have such as deer and other critters that like to eat our little seedlings. We want to make sure that we have trees that will persist across that landscape in future decades. So that means species that are relatively drought tolerant, if at all possible. So species like Douglas fir, ponderosa pine, grand fir, and yes, maybe even ponderosa pine on the, um, the west side in some places uh, where it did occur historically. Uh, in the uh, again, I'm going to just mention Oregon white oak as one of those uh, very drought tolerant hardwood species. It's a bit slow to get established, but I think it may be pretty happy in this warmer climate. It'll be more competitive than some of our other conifer species. Another thing we like to do is to increase diversity in every way and every place that we can. So this means increasing species diversity. We may not want quite as many of those Douglas fir monocultures that, that we have across the current landscape. And also it means structural diversity. So we may have this combination of closed and open canopies. Uh, we have complex canopy structure on the, on the left there. And we have uh, maybe some shrubby and other kinds of species in that gap. So this kind of thing helps us expand our portfolio so we don't end up with a monoculture all of the same age that might be very vulnerable 
to that insect or something else that comes in to kill it. So one of the topics that's being discussed more these days is this term assisted migration. It's kind of a fancy term. What it means is simply that we're moving trees around, landscapes, to places where they don't currently exist. So there are three ways that we can look at assisted migration when we're planting trees. One is to plant the current species from adjacent seed zones. Now I'll, sh I'll show you a map of that in a minute, but generally we like we have been planting trees from seed stock that was from the area where you intend to plant. Another type of assisted migration is planting different species than are currently present but extending their range only slightly from where they're currently distributed. And then the third one is planting different species a long ways from where they're currently distributed. So my recommendation is that first one up there where we're expanding the genetic uh, range of species is probably a good idea. Uh, we don't have good formulas for how to do that, but we think it may be a good thing to do in the future. The second one, Yes, maybe in some cases we can extend the range of some of our species at the edge of their current range. I think that could be useful, uh, but I really don't think it's quite yet time to do long range uh, transport of species. I know a lot of people say, well, you know, coast redwood grows really well up in Northern Oregon and Washington and uh, giant sequoia grows well, but they may also encounter some insects or pathogens that they are not resistant to. We could lose, the, lose all of those. So I think it's a much riskier prospect. And here's a map of seed zones for Douglas mm -hmm. fir in the state of Oregon. And you can see the boundaries there with little green lines. And so the concept here is right. that if you live in Northern Oregon, you may want to get some trees from seed zones farther to the South or perhaps seed zones farther or, or lower in elevation. The assumption being that the, the genetics of those species, those um, genotypes, would allow them to be more resistant in a warmer climate. Like I said, we don't have a recipe for this at the current time, and we're, we're desperately trying to collect some scientific data to support what we might actually do in the future. One thing I, I forgot to mention, too, is that you know, most of our Northwest conifers have high genetic diversity to start with. So they have survived, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of years in a, a lot of climatic variation. So I do have quite a bit of faith that over time, uh, they may be more resistant than we might think. Now, you know, the best thing we can always do with forest management, whether we're on public lands or private lands, is keeping those forests healthy. A healthy forest will always be more resistant to stresses. So that means keeping the stand densities at a place where there won't be too much competition out there. That's a, it's a big competition at all times for water, for light, for nutrients, and simply for space. Um, in some areas, this is normally more done on the east side of the Cascades. In some areas, we may want to also reduce some of the fuels in the surface and understory so that if fire does occur, uh, you can lower the fire intensity. So, and this really needs to be done at large spatial scales. If, we, if this happens at just, you know, 100 acres here, 100 acres there, it really won't have much impact. We have to do this uh, big time. All right, so we're, we're gonna go through now some uh, scenarios for different vulnerabilities that our forests and natural resources might encounter in the future. Then we're gonna talk about potential responses. So uh, Jessica just did a great job of covering what's going to happen with snow and water in the future. We expect much higher peak flows in the fall and winter in a lot of our streams. So what do we do with that? Uh, one kind of strategic approach is to design our infrastructure to accommodate that. So not to fight it, not to push it back, but to kind of roll with the punches. What does that mean specifically on the ground? Installing bigger culverts. Uh, we can maybe decommission some of those roads and floodplains that are not viable, won't be viable in the future, and maybe move some of our campgrounds out of areas that are continuously being flooded. Fisheries. So this, this connects very nicely with the water part. 
um, our, we have a lot of really, you know, very valued cold water fish species, most of our salmon species in the Northwest. Higher stream temperatures are very stressful. They need cold water. So what we need to do as much as we can is to restore and maintain that cold water habitat. So a lot about the restoration work that's already ongoing on national forests, other public lands, private lands, um, to restore structure and function of these streams is critical. We have to keep pushing restoration. We need to maintain riparian restoration to provide the shade to keep the streams cool. So we need to continue doing a lot of things that we're already doing, perhaps at a faster pace and perhaps at larger spatial scales. So uh, Jessica did a nice job of covering some wildlife vulnerabilities. And disturbance is a real, a real big problem for certain kinds of species, good for other ones. So one kind of um, adaptation strategy is simply to increase the resilience of that late successional habitat uh, that helps critters like flying squirrels, for example, the one shown there in the lower right. That means we have to put more emphasis on protecting what are often called legacy structures, you know, our big trees, the snags, the downed wood, uh, all those things that characterize old forests and allow certain animals to um, call them home. And Jessica, I forget exactly where we're going to transition here, so just let me know. You're doing just fine, Dave. Okay. Uh, again, Jessica covered recreation. So, um, we expect, you know, in, the, in the, on a hot summer, people like to find water. They like to recreate on lakes and streams and so forth. So water-based recreation will probably be in greater demand in the future. One thing we can do is maybe to alter the, the management of those sites and facilities to encourage some flexibility in how we administer water-based recreation, especially for a, a national forest that may have multiple options. Kinds of things we can do is well, we might have to have longer boat ramps if those lakes are going to be lower in the summer. Uh, if there's bigger demand for fewer resources, we may have to have a permit system or somehow manage the capacity of those sites. And, and also a really important and maybe underestimated factor is to communicate with the public that they may need to have somewhat different expectations of what they can expect in the future. We have a, a great storehouse of information on adaptation. This is, this is actually across the Western US, not just Pacific Northwest. All the information in this climate change adaptation library was derived from assessments that Jessica and I have worked on across the Western US in national forests and national parks and other lands. And there are over 800 adaptation options in the library covering all these different resources, vegetation, wildlife, water, and so forth. Uh, it's, it's a very nice, easy to navigate website. I encourage you to give it a try, see what you think. Uh, the point here is we have already developed a lot of options. We have some things that we can put on the ground tomorrow and we don't have to do another 10 or 20 years of research to try to figure out what's necessary. So it, we, we feel it's a, it's a good resource and a, a user-friendly one that our, uh, our partners in National Forest are really pretty happy with. So just to wrap up, uh, here's some things that we can do, but we need to think about managing not just today, but 30 years, 50 years and beyond into the future. So don't think about what has been in the past, but think about what will it be like in the future. Diversification is almost always our friend in terms of adapting to climate change. That means species diversity, genetic diversity and spatial diversity. We tend to think of big fires and other disturbances as catastrophes. They often are, in some cases, very dearly for people. But for resource managers, they can also be an opportunity for doing some things a little bit differently than you've done in the past. We can think about this essentially as risk assessment. Um, our national forest managers and public land managers do risk assessment all the time for different things, fire, insects, floods, and so forth. So we need to throw climate change in that mix now. And the most important thing here is as we 
start managing into the future with this warmer climate, we really need to pay attention to what the effects are. What are the things that work? What are the things that don't work? We can learn from that, and then we can adjust our approaches as needed. We have our emails listed here. You are more than welcome to contact us if you would like to talk about um, any of this work in the future, if you have questions about things. Uh, but in any case, we've gone through a lot of material very fast tonight, and I know there are a few questions in the chat box, so we'll, we'll wrap things up there and uh, take some questions. Thank you very much, David right. and Jessica. Michael, uh, the chat box. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, David and Jessica. You all really did cover a lot there. And we do already have some questions popping up in the chat box. And I want to encourage folks, if you do have questions um, and you haven't yet, put those right in that chat. Um, and we're going to try to get to as many of these as we can. I know that uh, David and Jessica said they could stay a couple of minutes after 730, but at some point we're going to have to wrap things up. So um, the the first really quick question, just to get out of the way that I've gotten a few times, is whether or not this um, presentation has been recorded, and the answer to that is yes, and that folks should expect an email from either Robert or I with a link to that recording um, that you can share with others. <clears throat> so let's see, the first question I see here about the presentation, um, looks like Chandra has a question here about mountain pine beetles. How, how far out of whack are they? Um, they're a native insect and outbreaks are part of the natural cycle. No doubt, no doubt they've expanded, but how do you slash can we know that climate change is changing things and by how much? Well, I can, I can take a shot at that one. Um, mountain pine beetle is in fact a native insect. That's a very important thing to, to talk about. And also it does have cycles. It typically kills old, lodgepole pine. That's its favorite food. It also attacks ponderosa pine. It typically attacks stands that are low in vigor, which is why we have this kind of cyclical thing that occurs over, you know, maybe 150 year cycle, something like that. What has happened uh, since about 1990 is that this has happened, so, that the outbreak has occurred so rapidly because this insect in the past would reproduce a brood once every two years. Now, in many cases, it's producing a brood every year. So that doubles the reproductive rate. Uh, the, um, the, the larval stage of the insect that's in the tree is no longer getting killed in the winter because of temperatures that are very low. Temperatures going up, more of them are living. And we're also seeing mountain pine beetle attacking species such as white bark pine, uh, foxtail pine, other species. Uh, high elevation species that have never been observed to attack before. So we feel like this is in fact something that's connected to the recent temperature increase over the past 30 years. And I, I am certainly one to be skeptical about those kinds of inferences, but I'm very convinced that this has been a recent climate change. So there are some things that we can think about with respect to management, and that is not to have enormous monocultures of lodgepole pine and ponderosa pine that will be targets for these species in the future. Targets for the beetle. Great, thanks for that answer. Next question we have here. I'm not sure if this was covered in the climate change assessments or not, but how does mycology of a forest ecosystem fit into these projections for the future of Pacific Northwest forests? You have any thoughts, Jessica, on that one? Yeah, I guess I'd say, you know, that drier conditions are, are not going to be good for some species. As far as the um, mycorrhizae and, and how those interactions will change, I don't think we have a lot of, a lot of information at this point to really guess how, how they'll be affected. I think it's a, an area of uncertainty, but I'll let you chime in, Dave, too, if you have thoughts. Yeah, it, it's kind of a timely question. Just this past week, there was a paper published in a journal called Forest Ecology and Management that documented 
that uh, what are called ectomycorrhizae, and, and mycorrhizae are these uh, connections between certain uh, fungal species and the roots of trees. Um, almost all of our trees require mycorrhizae to grow vigorously. But when we have severe fires, it can take a very long time for those ectomycorrhizal populations to recover, much longer than we had thought previously. So if we do have more fires and we have more severe fires, uh, the, the slowness of those uh, mycorrhizae to recover will probably reduce the, uh, the rate at which forests regenerate. So that could certainly have some effects, you know, kind of at a, at a very large spatial scale. And, and Jessica's absolutely right. There is not a lot of uh, good information on that. We certainly don't know much about how temperature affects mycorrhizal species directly, but that it's such an important organism and so intricately entwined with the, the life history of trees that it almost has to have some effect. Great, yeah, and I'll just add, you know, we've got a big group here tonight. I'm sure that there are folks that are well-versed in a lot of different topics. So if anyone here tonight has any resources that you wanna just uh, alert people to, you can go ahead and put those in the chat as well. Um, let's see, the next question here, uh, forest is made up of many plant species, not just trees. Did the assessment for the Columbia Gorge look at other plant species? Yeah, there are other plant species that are addressed. Uh, you will say the, the main focus is on trees and overstory, um, but there are uh, other species mentioned. I think the focus on trees is, is largely because we know more about the relationships between climate trees and, and disturbance. So a lot of, for a lot of the understory species, there isn't as much uh, understanding of, of how those, how changing climate and different disturbances are going to affect them. Um, but in, in addition to the vegetation chapter, there is a section um, on first foods and some culturally important uh, species, and that includes species like huckleberry. Uh, so there is some coverage of, of those important food species there as well. Great. So it looks like we've got kind of a slew of questions here about managed forests and thinning. Um, Let's see, I'll go with this one. The, the, uh, the good practices that David is talking about are focused only in managed forests. What about where we allow forests to regrow naturally? Are there best practices we should consider for these areas in a warmer climate or reasons to allow natural regeneration? Yeah, well, so that's, that's an issue we could talk about for, for quite a long time. Um, the, the, the key factor, you know, place we have to start that discussion is what are your management objectives? And so uh, the objectives on a particular national forest are going to be typically quite diverse. Although nowadays there's a, a very large influence on old forests. Uh, there's a large influence on certain types of habitat for certain types of animals. There's a strong emphasis on riparian protection. So large proportion of any national forest in the Northwest these days is to a certain extent going to be very passively managed. Uh, that's neither good nor bad, but it does provide some challenges when we get into this, this issue of, do we have really dense stands that might be unhealthy and therefore might be more susceptible? So we're, we're just starting to kind of wade into that issue. I, I think what we're going to see in the, the next, uh, well, actually just the next few years is a big discussion on this topic uh, where the fires occurred in Oregon and the west side. These are areas that uh, include a lot of very old forests. The habitat's been greatly changed. And I think the challenge will be to look at that matrix of forests of different ages. You know, Not all the forests were killed. There are a lot of trees that weren't touched. There are a lot of trees that were in intermediate severity classes. And so I think there's a great opportunity here for us to learn how to manage different types of forests that are in juxtaposition to one another. I hope we, I hope we learn a lot from that. I think that we may end up with some forest landscapes that are closer to our expectations of what we really would like to have, uh, both socially and for um, wildlife habitat. I think timber, you know, and, and I think there's a lot of concern in people's minds, well, the Forest Service is just wants to cut trees or whatever. And I think those days are decidedly over. 
and that will no longer be an emphasis on the west side, certainly, of the Pacific Northwest. There may still be some forest management timber, but I think you'll see management for mostly for other uh, resources, other values. All right, great to hear. That really segues well into these next couple of questions. Uh, looks like Mia is asking, did previously thin stands burn less intensely in the Labor Day firestorm? And then in that vein, Brenna has a question, is thinning for fire risk reduction useful for wind-driven fires like that, where in that case, fuel is not the limiting factor? Yeah, I can take a shot at that. I think uh, an answer, you know, did previously thin stands burn less intensely? We, it's yet to be determined. I think there'll be a lot of people out there looking at what happened in these fires in the coming years. And I think it's safe to say that when the, when the winds were really going and those fires were moving very quickly, it didn't really matter what was there in terms of young forest, old forest, thin forest. Uh, I think that, that the mortality was very high. Now there were uh, later parts on the fire where the winds were not as strong, uh, the fires dropped down a bit, slowed down a bit and crept around a little bit. I think that is where, uh, you know, changes in forest structure are more likely to affect uh, how the fire uh, affected those forests and, and whether or not there might be some areas with uh, lower mortality because of past thinning. Uh, but in general, on the west side, you know, in our in our forest that historically had stand replacement fire, where almost the entire forest was burned at high severity, we had almost, you know ninety percent or above mortality of the of the trees there. Thinning is not likely to really affect uh, future fire behavior because there's so much fuel there um, that you know when you have very extreme conditions, those those fuel treatments are, are not likely to be effective and can really change the fundamental um, character of the forest. But it's when we go into more frequent fire forests, into the mixed severity and, and low severity fire regimes, where those fuel treatments can are likely to have uh, an effect on fire behavior, um, especially under less than extreme fire behavior. And most of what we know about this, this whole issue of thinning and stand densities and fire is based on scientific data from the east side of the Cascade, where uh, thinning is, is routinely done, surface fuel treatments are done, prescribed burning. Now, those are practices that are very successful in our east side forest in terms of reducing fire intensity. But as Jessica mentioned, they just aren't practical or, or realistic on the west side. Great, thanks for those responses. We've got a question here about carbon sequestration. Um, how do we manage for us for maximum carbon sequestration and storage in order to slow the acceleration of global climate change? What can resource managers do today to maximize the climate stabilizing capacity of existing forests? Well, I can, I can start on that one. Um, the number one important thing is to keep forests as forests. And so wherever we can uh, to reforest areas that have been disturbed, to reforest areas that may have been converted to other uses, you know, whether it's agriculture or, or whatever. So that's number one, keep forests as forests. Um, there's, there's two points here. One is that uh, old forests store a lot of carbon but they don't take up much carbon dioxide. Young forests don't store much carbon, but they take up, they have very high uptake rate of carbon dioxide. So we're looking at uptake versus storage. And I think realistically, some combination of those strategies across a given landscape will probably be most successful. What we saw with these big fires last summer was how quickly that big storehouse of carbon could be somewhat depleted. Now, they, you know, we probably lost only about 20% or so of the carbon there, but eventually a lot of the rest of that will also decompose and oxidize and go up into the atmosphere. So to a certain extent, we won't have much control over some of these disturbances. And what we, what, what we can do perhaps, more so on east side forest and west side forest, is to control the rate at which 
carbon is emitted by fires. The good news is forests can be regrown and take up that carbon dioxide again. So it, it's always going to be this kind of large scale, you know, back and forth, up and down with carbon. Okay, switching gears here a little bit to water. What kind of impact will reduced snowpack have on water resources in the Willamette Valley? Yeah, our assessment didn't cover uh, the Willamette Valley. I will. I do know uh, there is a citation in there. There is an assessment done called the Willamette Water 2100 Project. I know that took an in-depth look at water in the Willamette Valley in the future. Uh, but we, there are a few things we can expect uh, consistently. Uh, one is we're we're likely to see more flooding in the winter mostly because of, of more precipitation as rain, again, rather than snow, and more intense precipitation events. And so even though the Willamette uh, is, is a bit more uh, rain-driven rather than snowpack-driven, those more the intense precipitation events are, are likely to uh, affect water levels and, and lead to more flooding. Uh, and then on the, on the reverse, when we have drier, uh, warmer conditions in the summer, we have basically more uh, water evaporating across the landscape, uh, lower snowpack again leads to lower summer stream flows. So we're likely to see wo lower water levels in the Willamette Valley in the future. And there are some, uh, you know, potential effects on some of the municipal watersheds with those uh, reductions in water in the summer when they're when the demand is at its peak. Great. And this next question really kind of relates to that. Can you discuss the role of keystone species like beavers? in adapting the forest for resilience, especially with regard to stream flow. If beneficial, how do we ensure policymakers and forest service invest resources to ensure that they thrive? Yeah, beavers are uh, kind of a climate change hero. Because when they build their dams, it really slows the movement of water uh, across the landscape. And so that it helps to slow, keep water on the landscape longer, uh, creates habitat, and so they're uh, increasing beaver populations is a, a very popular adaptation option. Uh, so I know the Forest Service is thinking a lot about it. I think the trick is that uh, beavers aren't appropriate in all situations, and they're not going to like, I mean, you, know, you have to get the right habitat for them. So you have to do some careful analysis in terms of where um, beavers will uh, thrive and, and where they're not going to have negative effects on, on people in the surrounding area. So there's, there's also a lot of work around and doing that sort of analysis and, and finding um, appropriate locations for beaver reintroduction. But there are several examples in the region of national forests reintroducing uh, beaver. And I know the Okanagan Wenatchee in, in Washington is one of those. Excellent. I know that uh, we here at BARC are very excited about the potential for restoring beavers back to some parts of Mount Hood National Forest, especially the, the Clackamas drainage. So looks like we got a question here about the gorge specifically. Of the diverse resources you looked at in this assessment, what are a few examples that have the greatest adaptive capacity and lowest sensitivity and exposure, especially in the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area. Um, let's see. I can um, probably think of a few wildlife species. I think um, one species that will likely do well uh, in the future is, is a uh, species like elk that really are dependent on early cereal habitat for forage. And so increased disturbance might be a good thing for those species because they'll have more early cereal habitat uh, to take advantage of. Um, yeah, Dave, you have other examples? Well, I'll bring up Oregon white oak again. It's probably a, a winner. Um, mo most of our Douglas fir will probably be okay in the Columbia River Gorge area. That would be our uh, probably go-to species in terms of being somewhat resistant to, and, and resilient to increased disturbance, for sure. Great, thank you. 
Looks like we have a question here. Do you believe that managed fires like those practiced by some Native American tribes are useful in the future of forest management for climate change? Yeah, I can, I can start. I think, yeah, prescribed fires are, definitely have a potential role to play in, in forests that were um, historically had relatively frequent fires, so those mixed severity, low severity regimes. I think uh, prescribed burning can really help to um, reduce fuels actually more effectively than mechanical treatments and uh, have a lot of uh, ecological advantages for those systems that are adapted to fire. Um, so I think, you know, it's going to be hard to do the fuel reduction we need to do um, all with mechanical treatment. So I think uh, wildland fire use and prescribed fire are, are really important tools. And th there's certainly been more discussion about managed natural fires. So once a, a wildfire is burning, maybe there are some of those fires that we should allow to burn rather than suppress them. And I think that you would find just about universal support in the Forest Service and other federal agencies to do more of that. The challenge is it's very difficult to do politically and socially because whenever you make the decision to allow a fire to burn, there's always a risk, maybe a small one, that it may burn out of control, burn into a populated area, uh, burn into a municipal watershed and, and really create some problems for human and social values. So I think we may see a bit more of that in our, our most remote areas, wilderness areas of the Cascades and uh, the Rocky Mountains, for example. Um, I wish we could do more of it. I think it's going to be very difficult to do that, however. Yeah, there definitely seem to be a whole lot of challenges in um, making prescribed burning socially acceptable to folks, especially after all the experiences of smoke that people had this last year, but I think that's a really important thing ahead of us. So we have another question here about fuels. I think somebody is wanting to get maybe a little bit more clarity about the difference between understory fuels and legacy structures. So, you know, which which of those need to be thinned to help, to help prevent fire spread or need to be preserved for the sake of supporting wildlife. Maybe you can talk a little yeah, bit I, about I can start on that one. The, the, the fuels that we're most concerned about are fine fuels. Fuels with a diameter of three inches or less on the, on the ground are the ones that provide most of the energy to a fire. And I know a lot of times you'll see big logs out in, in the forest and you think, man, there's a lot of fuel out there that would really burn hot. In fact, those big logs don't typically burn all that much most of the heat comes from the small stuff. So if you're going to focus on removing flammable fuels, then the small ones are the ones to, to deal with. We love having big trees. We love having big dead trees. Those are not really a concern in terms of adding fuel to the fire. It's just the fine fuel, the twigs, the branches, uh, the litter on the forest floor, and also some understory uh, plants, uh, shrubs and so forth that have fine, fuels, both living and dead, fine fuels. So uh, think, think of when you build a campfire, you know, the ones you start with are always the little pieces, right? You don't start with big logs. So it's those little pieces out there that cause us most of the problem. That makes sense to anyone who's ever built a campfire. So let's see, we got a question here about species shift. So what kind of distance shift do you expect for trees? species in their ranges, so taking maybe sugar pine, for example. I can start, Dave, and then you can pipe in. Um, range shifts are really going to take a very long time to happen. We don't expect them to occur very quickly. What, what we do expect uh, pretty quick shifts in species composition is after disturbance. So it's when we have those big fire events. And then uh, again, as Dave was talking about, those, those seedlings are much more sensitive to climate variation than a mature tree. A mature tree can withstand quite a bit of climate variation. And so uh, after those disturbance events are when we might see those, those you know, change in species composition and, and the, the species communities we have. Um, where we expect to see uh, shifts in range, generally you know, we expect species to move uh, upward in elevation, although we've already seen some uh, 
examples of when that might not happen. Uh, and then uh, northward in uh, latitude. And we expect, you know, the the trailing edge of a species distribution. So the kind of the the southernmost edge would be the area where we expect to see uh, a species uh, reduce be reduced in abundance uh, compared to historically. And whereas on the leading edge, where they're moving northward or upward in elevation, that's where we expect to see uh, more expansion. Uh, so there are projections for how far we might expect species to move. Uh, a lot of times those, those projections don't take into consideration things like uh, competition or disturbance. Um, so I, I don't know, uh, I have a, a lot of faith in those kind of projections uh, for the future. I'll let Dave pipe in. No, I think you captured quite well. There's certainly a lot of uncertainty. Uh, you can find um, scientific papers or popular articles that project with great confidence what they expect future spe species distribution will be. And I have found whenever people project things with great confidence, we're always surprised that uh, they don't really pan out. And I think that's going to be true here. We know from the, the paleoecological literature, you know, looking at sediment cores and lakes and examining pollen, that species have always shifted around. And so this will happen. It will happen slowly, as Jessica said, and there might be some surprises that uh, turn up. Thank you for that answer. Um, so it looks like we just have a couple minutes left here. I wanna make sure that I give Robert a chance to wrap things up. But before that, I wanted to um, direct people to a comment that David Bugney put in the chat as, as an FYI, the Clackamas River Basin Council is sponsoring a year long series of webinars focusing on the Clackamas River Basin. So topics are going to range from geology to climate, forest, fish, to Native American history and culture. And if folks are interested in that and want to register, you can visit clackamasriver.org. I'm just going to re-post that comment in the chat. Um, it's, it's really shaping up to be a very impressive and complete set of webinars and I'm really looking forward to it. And I think that the two of you might even be presenting as part of that again. So um, let's see, I think that uh, at this point, maybe Robert, can I turn it over to you and sure. uh, close us out for the night? All right. uh, I'd like to thank David and Jessica this evening for your presentations and also for your responses to everybody's questions. I think knowledge is power and the more we know, the more successfully we can sustain and uh, build and keep resilient forests and communities. So thank you for your input tonight. Thank you too, Michael, for uh, co-hosting the event this evening. Uh, I wanna thank everybody who attended this evening for your participation. We hope you're able to uh, use and share this information. And uh, with that, just like to say thank you and uh, good night.